Breaking news tonight, chaos erupting on the streets of Missouri. The grand jury finding no probable cause to indict Officer Darren Wilson in the death of an unarmed teenager, Michael Brown. And tonight, new documents, what the grand jury saw, including for the first time what Officer Wilson says happened that fateful night, sparking a massive showdown between protesters and police, escalating with reports of automatic gunfire, along with the vandalism and turmoil tonight. Moments ago, the police chief announcing their are roughly a dozen buildings still on fire and that although their main goal is preserving lives, the situation is far from ideal. I'm disappointed in this evening. Uh, I really don't have any hesitation in telling you that I didn't see a lot of peaceful protest out there tonight and I'm disappointed about that. I'm not saying there weren't folks out there that were out there for the right reason. I'm not saying that wasn't the case, but I am saying that unfortunately this spun out of control. That just moments ago, we turn now to ABC's Steve Osinsami, who is on the scene in Ferguson. Tonight, a city on fire, anger exploding in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, after the decision was finally announced in this racially explosive case. Darren Wilson, the Ferguson police officer, not indicted in the shooting death of unarmed 18-year-old Michael Brown. The grand jury deliberated over two days, making their final decision. They determined that no probable cause exists to file any charge against Officer Wilson and returned a no true bill on each of the five indictments. Just minutes after, protesters got violent, setting police cars on fire. They went pouring onto a highway, blocking traffic, police fighting them back with tear gas. <laughs> Gunshots rang through the air just feet from the Ferguson police station. The FAA issued a no-fly zone for the entire St. Louis area. And new tonight, prosecutors are releasing massive amounts of evidence. These never before seen pictures of Wilson in the moments after his alleged fight with the unarmed 18 year old and the gun Wilson used to kill him. A medical report from that night shows that Wilson needed x-rays and anti-inflammatory medicine for a facial bruise. And tonight for the first time we get Wilson's account. In his interview with police the day after the shooting, he said I was guaranteed he was going to shoot me. That's what I thought his goal was. This grand jury wasn't deciding guilt or innocence. They were just deciding is there probable cause to send this case to trial? Was there enough evidence for a regular jury to decide guilt or innocence? And these grand jurors said no. President Obama weighed in shortly after the news broke. Benjamin Crump, the attorney who represented the family of Trayvon Martin, another young black teen killed, was with Brown's family when they learned the news. She is heartbroken that the system would allow her unarmed son to be killed in broad daylight and the officer not even have to come to court. Brown's mother, who broke down into tears when she found out, is now demanding an explanation. In a statement, Officer Wilson defended his actions, saying he followed his training and followed the law. Prosecutors made sure the grand jury looked like the county, nine white jurors and three black jurors. But in Ferguson, Missouri, where Brown was killed, about 68% of residents are African American. The DA gave these grand jurors all of the evidence and says he didn't make a recommendation at all. In effect, punting to these grand jurors and saying, you decide. It's a case that picks at one of America's oldest wounds, racial injustice in the sense that black lives don't matter. Right now, this town that promised to remain peaceful already boiling over with anger from demonstrators. We met Haiku, a young activist and hip hop artist back in August at the height of the protest. Tonight, he waited in the crowd right in front of the police department. We knew that though. Police here prepared for the worst. St. Louis County police alone bought 650 tear gas grenades and 2,000 plastic handcuffs and 1,500 bean bags filled with chemicals that sting the eyes and nose. But the outrage isn't just here in Ferguson. The decision has led to fresh protests all across the country. We have police brutality lit alive and well all over the country. Ferguson is a spark. In New York, hundreds of protesters are meeting in Union Square, ready for the long haul. So our message to the people in Ferguson is that we are with you 100%. Promising these protests will end no time soon. We're going to be here at 2 o'clock. We're going to be here at 5 o'clock. We're going to be here at 7 o'clock. We ain't going no 
The decision comes 108 days after Brown died. He was walking with a friend when his friend says they were confronted by police and told to get off the street. Witnesses say Brown put his hands up, giving in as the bullets flew. I saw a kid with his hands up and the cop continue to shoot him until he fall down to the ground. Police and other witnesses told a different story, saying Brown fought with Officer Wilson when he stepped out of his vehicle. They say Brown pushed Wilson back into his squad car, gave him a beating, and went for Wilson's gun. In his grand jury testimony, Wilson describes the moments leading up to his confrontation with Brown. He had already shot at him several times, but says that Michael Brown, quote, still keeps coming at me. I'm backpedaling pretty good because I know if he reaches me, he'll kill me. When he gets about that eight to 10 feet away, I look down. I remember looking at my sights and firing. All I see is his head, and that's what I shot. I don't know how many. I saw the last one go into him, and then when it went into him, the demeanor on his face went blank. The aggression was gone. It is our understanding at this point in the investigation that within the police car, there was a struggle over the officer's weapon. Six days after the incident, police released this surveillance video. They say that's Michael Brown wearing the red hat, allegedly committing a strong arm robbery at a liquor store just 15 minutes before he was shot. Then there's this surveillance video released just this month showing Officer Darren Wilson leaving the police station just hours after the shooting. In this image, he doesn't appear to have any visible injuries from a fight. Michael Brown's family demanded action. How can peace be restored, ma'am? Arresting this man and making him accountable for his actions. In August, peaceful protests quickly turned violent. Thieves used the protest as an excuse to loot and burn down this convenience store. Be able to see? The National Guard moved in to enforce a state mandated curfew. You must leave immediately. No justice! No curfew! The guy with the gun up there, Ferguson quickly became ground zero for one of the most intense civil rights debates in recent memory. In the middle of the action was where we met Haiku, the hip hop artist documenting the unrest. Y'all yeah, was just marching and then tear gas. Just gassed. marching and they start tear gas. That burn. As soon as the sun goes down, man, it's like it's like a third world country that's that's fighting for liberation once again because it really it really is like that. New clues came in with the county autopsy and toxicology reports. Brown's tissue fragments were found on the exterior surface of the police officer's motor vehicle, a detail that seemed to support police accounts that Brown violently fought with the officer. But Michael Bodden, the famous forensic pathologist hired by Brown's family, held an independent autopsy and found that Officer Wilson shot and killed Brown from a distance. The muzzle of the gun was at least one or two feet away. The muzzle at the time of discharge, it could have been 30 feet away. As for Officer Darren Wilson, he has not been seen in public since August 9th, but records show that he got his marriage license in October and he did testify to the grand jury. Just this weekend, Michael Brown's father pleading for calm ahead of the grand jury decision. I thank you for lifting your voices to end racial profiling and police intimidation. But hurting others or destroying property is not the answer. But tonight, protests rage on as stores and houses burn to the ground and the looters using the name of Michael Brown to steal. But these protesters are calling for justice, something they fear they may never see. The prosecutor here now has the difficult task of trying to convince so many people who refuse to believe it that justice was served here. Juju. Thanks, Steve, for your coverage these past few months. Stay safe. I'm joined now by my Nightline co-anchor Dan Abrams with his legal hat on tonight. Dan, clearly the matter is not over in the streets or in the court of public opinion, but from a legal perspective, is it over? The criminal case is basically over. Uh, the feds are investigating as well. It's likely that will go nowhere with regard to this case. But it's still possible that you'll have a civil lawsuit whereby the family sues Officer Wilson, sues the police department, and all of these issues are addressed again. And what's the legal burden of proof? There it would just be by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, much lower than in a criminal case. But remember, no criminal jury evaluated the evidence yet, just a grand jury deciding there isn't even enough evidence to send the case to trial. Interesting. Now, the St. Louis prosecutor was criticized for being very hands-off. Tonight, you saw a different attitude. Well, he seems to be supporting the grand jury's decision. Not quite saying that, saying he handed it off to the grand jury and they reviewed all of the evidence objectively. But the way he sounded in that press conference, it sounded as if 
he was backing up the grand jury, supporting them in exactly what they decided and how they decided it. And now we have this huge dump of information that they have now um, released to the public. Very unusual to release all this grand jury material. So in theory, the public can decide for themselves and understand, the prosecutor hopes, why some of the eyewitness testimony that we've heard so much about was contradicted by the physical evidence, according to the prosecutor. He took a long time putting it into context. Absolutely. He wants the public to not just understand, but accept the grand jury. It's not going to be easy. You have a lot of reading ahead of you, Dan. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your being with us.